Welcome to the Attuned to You Podcast. I am Ash Marshall O'Dell, spiritual teacher and mentor, healer, intuitive, medium, empath, shaman, Reiki master and teacher, meditation facilitator, crystal therapist, master's degree teacher, and author of the book, Lightbound, a healer's journey through trauma, CPTSD, and anxiety. In season two of the Attuned to You Podcast, we delve into connections as new guests share stories, skills, and tools to help you tune into possibilities for self-empowerment, growth, and adventure. Ash Marshall Adele with the Attune to You podcast, and today I am joined by Tabitha Birdweaver, duly licensed psychotherapist. Thank you so much for joining me, Tabitha. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Ash. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I really have so much gratitude for therapy, not only personally, but even professionally, because a lot of people require that in order to help them move forward in life. And I love this talk that we're having today because I think there's so much misunderstanding and um, just not a lot of knowledge really about what therapy is all about. And so I'm very pleased and grateful that you could join me and help broaden that understanding. And I would love to ask you a couple of things just right off the bat. So I know that you have been in this profession for quite a while, and I'm so curious what drew you to being a counselor? Well, that's a fantastic question and not to answer for anybody else in my field, but most of us got into therapy to figure out our own stuff. And that's 100% true for me. And so it was when I was doing my own therapy that I realized, oh my gosh, <laughs> like there's a way to fix this stuff and I'd like to give back. And so that's what got me rolling. And that is beautiful, right? It's just amazing when you figure out something and you're able to actually help others as well. It's such a wonderful way of, I don't know, I don't want to say pay it forward exactly, but in a way of giving. Um, Absolutely. I think of it as a way of spreading the love. That is awesome. I love that so much. So I was also curious, what is your absolute favorite thing about what you do? My absolute favorite thing about being a therapist and what I do, hands down, the best thing about that is watching people become empowered. I love that. I mean, I just got chills. I love that. And, and I can always tell when it's coming too, because I mean, there are stages, right? The first one is waking up. And that's fun to watch people go ding, 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 and get these light bulbs, right? And then as they start to process those light bulbs, realizing how much inside of them they have to offer and how much they're valuable and lovable and important. When I see people absorbing those realizations and those truths, it makes every bit of, uh, well, every bit of my master's degree (laughs) and all the other requirements to be a therapist well worth it i get paid back every day that is amazing and beautiful and it must feel so good and fill your cup up to know that you're doing such a worthwhile thing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, thank you thank you and then there's also there's so much um i want to say stigma perhaps attached in a lot of ways with sort of the majority of our culture in America and perhaps other areas. I can't really speak to that. Um, Particularly in regards to mental health and therapy as it goes together and in general. So I'm just sort of curious um, if you could talk a little bit about how therapy benefits us in so many ways. Um, You know, like just some general examples of how therapy works and adds to people's lives, their relationships, et cetera. No problem. I would love to talk about that, Ash. (laughs) So because therapeutic benefit is available in a lot of different types of therapy, and there are a lot of different types of therapy. And I think maybe we should start there because therapy is not just for people with um, clinical language with severe and persistent mental illness. And what that means is the things we think about on scary TV shows, schizophrenia, (laughs) right? Dissociative identity disorder. There are multiples of you. Uh, First of all, there's been a lot of bad information given to our our society about that, but that's not all therapy is for. Mm -hmm. 
right? So therapy can help you in a lot of different ways. If you're coming as an individual, then you're looking for individual therapy. And the point of therapy is usually to help you identify places where you have core beliefs. And we can talk more about that later if you want. Core beliefs that are kind of um, misaligning you with what your purpose is, right? So if you're always in internal conflict, feeling doubt about yourselves, not sure what else to do, therapy is a good place to start because in therapy, you'll find you. Mm. And that's key, right? There's also relational therapy, and that would be somebody with a systems therapist like me, marriage and family therapist, couples and family therapist, anything with those types of titles that can help you figure out basically communication breakdowns, any place where you can improve your behavior to help your partner and therefore your relationship. Um, so that's a great place to go. And included in that is family therapy. And so if you're struggling as a family, getting into a room with a professional who's objective can be really help helpful to sort those things out. Um, and there are many other kinds of therapies, but the way that those three help is they'll get you in touch with yourself, which is the key. If you don't know who you are, what you want, what you're supposed to do, those are important questions for therapy, <laughs> right? But it also can help you connect with other people who you love and don't love, right? In different ways, different boundaries. And it can help you change your perspective on the world in which we live. You can go from feeling unsafe to secure in therapy. And that's really, really important. Oh, goodness, right? Yeah. Seriously, yes. And everyone has relationships. The important one, I would say, most of all, the one to yourself. And so if you can work on that part of you, everything else in your life, including your relationships, benefits. That's such a wonderful thing to be able to develop that. I know it's been called um self-talk and there are lots of different types within the ones that you name that just help people in different ways mm -hmm. and that core belief that you had mentioned earlier I would love for you to chat a little bit about that because I think that is probably a huge and very key component to helping people sort of understand better uh absolutely so the first thing I would say is that everybody has core beliefs and if you don't think you do, no offense, but you're wrong. You do, because it's just how our human brain works. So developmentally as humans, we assess our environment all the time. Even right now, you and I are assessing our environment, Ash. Like, is it, I'm getting a little hot under my lights, <laughs> you know? So we're always assessing our environment. And we take that information and make structures inside of our heads so that we don't get hurt. So for example, let's say you're bebopping along and uh, you realize that there's a snake right in front of you. And so you pause and stop because you've seen a snake before, you know what they look like, you might hear a rattle if it's a rattlesnake, right? But all of those, those ways of understanding our environment create structures. And so you could be like somebody who's like, ooh, a snake, I know how to avoid that. Or you could be somebody who's like, oh no, a snake, I'm paralyzed. It depends on the underlying core belief. And I feel like I might have gotten off in the weeds there. So I'm going to come on back and just like be super clear what core beliefs are. Most of our core beliefs are formed in childhood, but they can be formed after. If you have a pivotal experience, it can change your mind about things, right? So for example, if you think no one loves you and all of a sudden you meet that one person who just keeps doing it, that can change your mind. The trouble with core beliefs is that we don't know when they're functioning because it's just reality. It's just reality. So that's a little dip in the pool. Would you like more information or what? any questions about that? I have likened it to wearing um, glasses that are kind of like goggles that are just attached to your face. And if you've always had them on or worn them a very long time, it's like you don't even realize they're there. And then if you were to imagine having like 50 pairs of lenses in those goggles with different things on them, like shapes, colors, um, maybe there's a scratch or you perceive a crack in the ground that's not even there. You kind of alter your behaviors to fit what you perceive to be there. Yep. 
And as a therapist, I would love if, if you find that to be sort of a valuable analogy, because it's kind of hard to explain core beliefs in the way that you perceive, because it isn't just visual. It is, it's how, it's, it's what words you pick up on. Um, it's what language you use. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you would talk more about that, that would be amazing. You bet. First of all, that's a fantastic metaphor or example, and I might just rip you off <laughs> with yeah. that because I mean, what you're talking about, that experience of not even knowing they're on your face, that is because here comes another clinical word that I'm sure you all have heard. It's in your subconscious. And what that means, we have different layers to our consciousness. You and I are both conscious right now that we're talking, we're recording this, we know what we're talking about, that's in our awareness. I'm also conscious behind that, that after this, I have a couple other things to do and so do you, right? So we can hold up to six things plus or minus two, which means sometimes eight, sometimes four, depending on your stress level, up to four things in our consciousness. Everything else that you can even know about is in your subconscious. And then we have unconscious, which is you don't even know that's existing at all, right? Like you got beamed in the head with a baseball and you don't know what happened for 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, you're out. Subconscious is where all of this stuff we're talking about lives. So one of the examples, um, and you might want to flash a I I don't know what you do on your podcast as far as pictures, but like that image of an iceberg yes. where there's a little bit above, that's our subconscious. The rest of it is, is subconscious. And I would say the unconscious is the water it's floating in, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, yeah I'm, not, I'm not sure if other people will agree with that. I just spun off the top of my head, but that subconscious stuff drives you. So here's an example of what I mean by drives you. Let's use driving. Have you ever been going down the highway? You know where you're going and all of a sudden you're there <laughs> and you don't remember the exit that you took. That is subconscious autopilot, right? And we all do it. Can you relate? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> so here's how most of us will start to discover our core beliefs in that subconscious. We'll have a reaction. Right. So something happens in your environment and all of a sudden you're terrified or ticked off or horribly sad, whatever. But even to you, the emotion seems bigger than what just happened. That's because it is you're responding probably to your current situation, but also to all of the history that your subconscious has had and made into structures around beliefs. So for example, here's a great, I'll be, I'll be uh, transparent and give an example of how I started to notice some of my subconscious. So I used to have this habit of when something didn't go as planned, it would just freak me out and I would get overwhelmed and have anxiety and then pissed, <laughs> pissed. And so if you're in my way, you better get out of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm making myself sound awful, but there were times where that was actually true. And I realized, okay, so I threw, literally this happened, I threw the recyclable toward the recyclable bin and missed. And now you better get out of my way. Because it's not the missing of the bin. It's the thing I was thinking underneath it, which was, you never do anything right. Nobody's going to help you whatever, you're stupid. Those are really common ones that I hear in my practice, you know? And so when we have a reactivity to something that we know is too big, chances are you've just bumped into a core belief that you probably could change and have a lot more relaxation in your life and a lot more flow. And I know that's important to your audience is how do we get the flow? Well, every time you have an overreaction, you're messing up your flow bad. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> boo on reactions <laughs> oh yes yes mm -hmm. and it is so hard because those reactions happen before you even really consciously process that you have reacted like you snap at someone yes. or um oh my gosh there's so many different ones or right. you know you just you just feel not like you normally do when you are relaxed and in flow and yeah. that's, that's a really hard one because it's mental emotional physical mm -hmm. and it's even your energy your hormones because those are involved so you know everything that was kind of a mind blower when I learned about that that all of your emotions are actual chemical hormones that run yeah. in your body and I'm like well crap 
<laughs> yep, emotions are hormonal, even not just during menopause, just put that out there <laughs> all the times, right? So, I mean, and we're talking about things right now in a context where, like, I can recover from being mad because I missed a shot, right? And I can apologize to my kid for being like, rah, 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 because I missed a shot and had this core belief and felt worthless myself, right? So I'll just kick it down hill a little bit. But this can be dramatic, Ash. Like, let's say, um, well, you know me, I'm a trauma therapist. And so that's my frame of reference. Let's say that you have rejection sensitivity because you grew up in a really rejecting household. Of course you do. That's what keeps you safe from rejection is being sensitive to it. So you can be like, I'm out of here whenever you feel it coming, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you grow up having to cope like that and then you become an adult, you might see things like you get a, a mediocre review at work and you can't get out of bed for three weeks, right? That happens. And so if that's happening to you, please know that you're not alone in that. Which is also crucial because I think for a lot of people that have had lots of trauma, you feel isolated and alone and like no one would understand you. Right, because I don't even know that you can understand yourself truly in that moment within the context of those beliefs, those goggles again, right? Mm -hmm. And so, it's really lovely um, that there are people out there that help you connect not only to yourself, but to new ways of interacting mm -hmm. with yourself and ways of shifting shifting out of those. Cause that's a, a lot of what therapy is, is helping you to shift out of those core beliefs and take off those layers and layers of lenses for clarity. Cause right. When you are in those stuck beliefs, you really don't have a lot of clarity, do you? It's there's, there's sort of a hand in hand function between clearing out and bringing in different shifts in your thinking and your feeling yeah. that help you get clear here. I would love for you to maybe chat just to scope about that because I know you'll do it a lot better than what I'm going to say. <laughs> I personally think you said that great. Oh. <laughs> um, it made a lot of sense to me. I think um, maybe what you're looking for is that uh, in therapy, and there are different kinds of therapy, so I'm going to name off a couple right now because they'll get us to the angle that you're asking for, right? So there's cognitive behavioral therapy, which is basically what everybody learns in school. It's fine therapy. It has been researched a lot as effective and it's true. And so if you choose a cognitive behavioral therapist, what you're going to get is thinking and behaving changes, right? Which I approve of 100%. <laughs> but if you choose an energy psychologist, you're going to get thinking and behaving changes, spiritual changes, energetic changes, right? And so when what we're looking for is that flow again, and I don't know about you, Ash, but I have had experiences in my life where like I get in my head that it's not my fault. There's nothing I could do all those things. And I still feel like crap. Mm -hmm. That's the energy piece. Because what we know now, and those of us who have been energy psychologists for a while have known forever, and plus, if you've ever worked with kids, you know this, <laughs> energy is absolutely the way we bring ourselves to life, regardless of how you think and regardless of what you behave like, right? So if your energy isn't flowing, those thoughts won't matter. So what you were talking about before is taking those thoughts and changing them. And I think there are three therapies that are perfect for doing this. One is called EMDR, eye movement reprocessing, desensitization and reprocessing. EFT, which lots of people have heard about is tapping. It's really great. And advanced integrative therapy, which as you know, is hands down my fave on the planet. Absolutely. What those therapies include that isn't always in other therapies is something called adaptive processing right? So in cognitive behavioral therapy, it can be cut and dried. You're supposed to have this thought, so practice it. There's truth to that. I'm worthy. I am good, whatever, right? In energy psychology, we can go in, find the thought, figure out what you'd prefer to think, and then move that all the way through your body in one session. And so what ends up happening is people get through therapy faster and deeper. I hope I... 
I hope I hit that for you a little bit in the right. You did because we do produce all of these emotional hormones, these chemicals, yep. and they've now understood more recent. Um, I don't know what in the last five, 10 years, especially it's become more known that we store those chemicals in our bodies and they are in your fat tissue. They're in your connective tissue. They're in organs. They're in all kinds of places in the body. And when they're stuck there, you are inhibiting the flow of your actual natural processes. And so when you're releasing all of that with AIT, EMDR, and EFT, you're creating that um, body opening within all those tissues um, to allow those chemicals to move out of your body and energetically, which is a huge thing for me. I'm like, yay, you do feel so much better. Oh my gosh, it is amazing because I do have um, CPTSD. I did have general anxiety disorder. I'm not 100% on all of that part of it, but as you change, you become freer within your own body, don't you? And what a huge difference that makes. And it allows you to feel so much in your body so differently than what you have felt before. You have more energy. And you know, there's another reason why, because right, when you're not running those same loops and you're not thinking those same thoughts, you're not triggered all the time, right? I would love for you to talk about triggers because that is probably another one of those huge things for people that they may not know or sure. understand a lot about. You yeah. bet. I'm happy to talk about, I'll talk about anything, Ash, you know that because I love this stuff. We've already talked about triggers. Right. When I was not, not to dismiss that, but when I was talking about how you might have a reaction, you've been triggered. That's what it is. And so there are a lot of different ways you can get triggered, but here are the ones that I think get us the most. And I'll start with my hand, five things, your <laughs> senses, your senses. Okay. Have you heard that before? And it hurt you trigger. Have you seen that before? And it hurt you trigger All right i'll quit snapping i'm realizing that's not, i'm just being like aggressive because i hate triggers i want them to go away right have you felt it before in your body trigger have you tasted that before trigger have you smelled that before which can be one of the most triggering triggers of them all because it goes straight from your nose to your hippocampus no stops <laughs> right so <laughs> I mean, so, so when you feel that reactivity, look around you, what just happened? It can also, you can also be triggered by people. Mm -hmm. If they remind, I mean, people who have hurt you will definitely trigger you, but if they remind you, if, you know, if somebody has hurt you, then you can be triggered around that places, situations, anything can be a trigger. And the reason that's true is because trauma is subjective meaning you can be in a car wreck with somebody same same car same experience one will come out traumatized the other not and there's okay. nothing nothing right and that doesn't mean you're weak or bad if you're the one who ends up with trauma it means that something there was important to you and you never want that to happen again that's the structures we set up and why we end up with triggers and dysfunctional patterns and you know if you have them right? Like eating every time you're stressed, working out every time you're stressed, dating the same person again and again, <laughs> different people that are the same person. Those are patterns. And so we want to interrupt those mm. as soon as you notice it. So for example, with the missing the recycling bin example, the thing to do there is just go like, wow, I'm really mad about that. What's up? Mm. Like literally just take the pause. Why? What am I thinking or feeling that would make me feel that bad? And you might have to go through several layers of thinking and feeling because your subconscious is smart. <laughs> and once we put in a booby trap so that you know you're in danger and it's gonna go off, good luck getting near that thing without kindness, gentleness, care for yourself. So if you come in trying to bully yourself out of triggers, you're gonna make another one. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Because I think the instinct is 
at least for me, when I first really started learning and understanding, I wanted to rip it out. Like I wanted to, rip, I wanted it all out, rip, 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 it. go, go, go. I know it. And it's hard. It is really hard. And I think as you are concurrently in therapy, you are really truly also learning. And this is probably the hardest one, compassion for yourself. Yep. And I don't think a lot of people even truly understand what compassion actually is either. I think there's sort of like a, a slight um, offness about our sort of cultural definition for that word. And I would <laughs> love, because we've talked about compassion, I would love for you to just maybe define it in a way that people can really connect into that. Okay. I'm noticing a little trigger. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I'm just going to, before I define it, I'm just going to say our culture is not compassionate in general. And that's part of our traumatic problem. We're expected to get up and do it anyway. And that is a horrible way to live. <laughs> right? So that's changing. I'm happy to say, I mean, it's changing. We've got a lot of influencers and as minorities get more powerful, that will improve too. So definition of compassion is being able to observe. And again, I'm making this up. There's lots of definitions of compassion. This is mine being able to accept yourself, even when you don't do the thing you think you should have done in the way you should have done it. Right. And so for those of us with CPTSD, because I'm a CPTSD or two, perfectionism <laughs> is a compassion killer. Right. So good luck. And what you're going to need to do is just notice when you do better every time. So, for example, the first time I missed the recycling bin, mad, had to work it out, took me a day to figure out what was going on. Now, when I miss the recycling bin, it's like, oops. And that's compassion. It's beautiful. Love, love for yourself when you make mistakes and you will, you're human. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. there's so many things that we as humans do make mistakes on, but in our culture, mistakes are not really allowed oh. in a way that is helpful. <laughs> no they are they are in fact punishable yes right yes and that's a hard one for us to understand that it is okay and that mistakes are more about learning right so not about punishment but learn from it absolutely and without compassion you won't because you can't bully yourself out of your triggers that's how they got there in the first place right that's right <laughs> I mean, one way or another, something scared or hurt you. And so I just want to take a step back, if it's okay with you, Ash, for me to tangent off, right? Uh, but you knew what you were getting into. Um, <laughs> when you make a mistake, this might sound crazy, but when you make a mistake, I would encourage you to think that it's kind of fun. Because what we know is that humanity has benefited from our mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's the only way we learn, right? We have to learn by making mistakes. When Even when we're learning language as a little baby, we learn by mistakes, because not everything is a doggy. <laughs> you know what I mean? But then, but when that's the only word you know, you say doggy for cow, cat, you know, but then as you grow and learn, you realize, oh, this is a doggy, this is a cat, this is a cow, and now you have more power mm. to, because you're identifying different things. This is an exciting topic and I've spun off again. When you make a mistake, I would encourage you to say, yay, I'm human. And that's not easy to start. So when you make a mistake and you don't do that, be like, oh, I made another mistake by not doing it. Yay, I'm human. So kind of starting off with sorry, not sorry. That's a good way to be. And it, it takes time. I think the other problem with a lot of our belief reframing and changing is Societally, and I'm so sorry, I have an elderly kitty who absolutely despises closed doors. So he has decided that he's upset about this door closed. So he's currently <laughs> pounding the door and scratching nails down it. So there may be some caterwauling in a moment. So please, please bear with us. <laughs> We're going to have compassion for that kitty. <laughs> <laughs> but when we make mistakes, um, 
and we start learning from them, reframing beliefs and making changes. In our culture, we have this thing of instant, right now. We have to have it done right now. It should have been done yesterday. Or as I used to be, I wanted it done two weeks ago. <laughs> right? And so having that um, thought that, you know, this is going to take time. It's not an instant thing because you're not only changing your thoughts, you're changing your body. Like, there's so many changes and you're learning and unlearning. Like, it's it's convoluted, which is why therapists are so crucial in the process. And it's um, amazing what a difference. Compassion, allowing yourself some time and space to make those changes. Yeah. And as you said, mistakes are crucial for yeah. learning. Yes. I like to say, I'm going to, I like, I have done this where I like, I have made that mistake and I jokingly said it and I enjoyed it so much. I'm going to probably do it again. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's a great example of how to take it light. Right. Light good. Light and easy. I'm really saying that light and easy. And that is such a wonderful way to think about that, isn't it? Just, ah, you know, <laughs> Life gets heavy. So anytime I feel like we can ease it to a little bit gentler and um, just freer way, it just feels better regardless of what's going on in your life, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, seriously. And there's so much in there, you know, because there are, I remember seeing this thing that had, gosh, there probably were a hundred or more emotions and it had anger. And I think that's kind of a crucial one. And I would love to just have you maybe chat just a little bit about anger as sort of that mask, about all the stuff, you know, that's behind it and sort of what the function of anger is. And then in therapy, when you get through that and then how that sort of helps you get in touch with yourself more deeply. You betcha. Um interrupt if I go off because I love talking about this stuff. Anger is my favorite emotion. And a lot of people are like, say what? <laughs> <laughs> I also love contentedness and joy, of course, right? But anger is really important. There's a myth that anger is only a secondary emotion. And that's not true. We're going to talk about the secondary emotion, which is what you're asking about in just a second, right? But anger in itself is a pure emotion. And it's an important one. It is literally the emotion that lets you know when your boundaries are violated, and you need to make a change, period. That's what anger is for get off my lawn. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so the important thing to know about anger when you're actually being violated and it's and it's pure anger is number one, it's always about boundaries. And so either you need a different boundary with somebody else, like you can't talk to me like that. It's one of the first boundaries I set in my life, right? Or you need a different boundary with yourself. So here's a quick example of that. Uh, and I'm just gonna role play for a minute. Hello. Yes, I would love to bring something to the potluck. Okay, see you Sunday. Click. I don't effing want to do that. I don't want to make. Now I'm mad at them because I said yes. <laughs> All right. So you might need a different boundary internally if you're getting mad all the time. You also might need to leave a relationship. So, well, that's another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Anger is a secondary emotion, is when we are having an experience our core belief comes in mm -hmm. and we make it about us. And so we get mad, right? We get mad that we have grief. We, yes. get, we get mad that we have, have sadness if you're not quite at the level of grief. We get mad that we have confusion, which by the way is an emotion, <laughs> right? And so we are frustrated. And I think a lot of people experience frustration as anger. And that's why we're having this conversation. And it is, there's an anger energy to it, right? But frustration also has an element of grief because it's not what you expected. And there's a deep sadness when things don't go as we expected for different reasons. Like in my household growing up, when things didn't go as I was expected them to, it was not safe. Mm -hmm you better move. Right. And so I adopted that miss the recycling can you better move. Right. So anger is actually a positive 
emotion because it can teach you a lot. It can let you know where you're at. And I'll tell you what for, when my clients who are suffering, and it is suffering with depression or bipolar depression, start getting angry, I'm like, now we're in the money. <laughs> ah, let's go. Let's go. Because that anger is not only informative, it's motivating. Because mm. anger, you've got energy coming out, right? Yes. So, and that helps you get stuff done, right? Yep. The, it's sort of like in that mid range. If you were, I remember, like, see, shame was 20 hertz, and you have enlightenment all the way up to 800 hertz. And anger was sort of that mid lower range where, I'm going to make some change. It's like a, mm, this is happening kind of forward momentum. And then as a mask for all those other emotions, when you start um, kind of diving beneath the anger, because that one often, as you say, masks sadness and other stuff, but we prefer anger um, to those others. Why do humans do that? Do you happen to know the answer? <laughs> I don't know that all humans do do that. Mm -hmm. I do know that Americans do that because that's who I primarily work with, right? So, you, I mean, you're asking why we push off into anger, our other emotion. Is that right? Okay. Yes. Amazingly, anger is one of the most accepted emotions in our society for men. Yes. Mm-hmm. So women learn how to be angry differently, right? And mm -hmm. I really do think that the reason we mask up emotions with anger is two different things. One, that underlying emotion is too much. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, something in you is telling you, I can't dip into that or I will be sad forever or I will die. Something dramatic feels like it's going to happen if you tap into it. And so, boop, a little overlay of anger, this one we can deal with, right? I really think that's one core thing. I also think that people get angry when they're ready for change. Mm -hmm. And so anger can be a very positive indicator that you're on the right road. Beautiful. Mm. And we're not really taught to think about anger in those two ways, are we? I it's, wasn't. No, right? No, no, no. You better swallow that down. <laughs> Do not display that, you know, because that, we aren't taught, I think, to healthily process emotions. And I think a lot of what therapy does is to teach us, one, how to access those, you know, unmasked emotions, and two, then how to process them healthily because what I've learned in research is that the hormones, the, the emotions, they're chemical messengers. Messenger being the key word, what you just talked about earlier with anger, every emotion has sort of a message for us about ourselves, right? That those core beliefs that we develop, our behaviors, our relationships, like there's so much encapsulated within the human experience. It's amazing. It's mind blowing. And I, I probably could talk with you about this for weeks and we probably would just scratch the surface of all of this. But I think what I would really love is to just lightly touch on what I, I spoke about healthily processing emotions. If you could speak to that um, from a therapeutic viewpoint, I, I think that would be really helpful to listeners to understand that a little better. Okay. Just to clarify, you want me to talk about a healthy way to process emotions. Yes, okay. Got it. So the first thing that I would say is involved in a healthy way of processing emotions. It's two things that are tied for first spot. The first is get in your body. And when we're having big emotions, we don't want to be in our body because, mm -hmm. because hormones actually hurt, right? Did you know that some pieces of your blood get sharp? when you're angry? Did not. Yeah. Fascinating. Right? So look it up. Look that up. All right? <laughs> I mean, they literally are like little daggers in your blood. And that's what anger feels like. Right? And so get in your body because if you don't know what you're feeling, you cannot process it. And I mean, feeling in two ways, emotionally and physically. So when I say get into your body, what you can notice is, okay, every time I miss the recycling bin, I get a lump in my throat. Or every time I think I have to go see my family, I feel oppression. Or every time I get ready for work, I've got a knot in my stomach. Those are really good indicators that you are having energetic blocks and your subconscious is telling you you're not in a good spot. Mm 
So try and be embodied. And you can start doing that by just noticing literally where you feel it when you feel it. Right? Okay. The other thing is take a space, which you're already doing if you're noticing. So thumbs up on that and take another space to breathe. You must breathe. The number one way your body knows you're safe and secure is an easy breath. Now, you don't have to force your breath. It'll get bigger if you ease into it. Right? <laughs> so those, those are the starting places because without those two things, any other processing won't happen. At least it won't happen well. Right. And so after you're in your body and you've taken that space and that breath, now you start to realize that there's some thought going on. All right. And so that's where you're going to do a deeper dive and you can maybe do it on your own, but maybe in therapy, what is the underlying core belief I have that triggers me in these certain situations? So that's one way to do it. Another way is to do all of that stuff minus the therapy until you get to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to advocate that everybody on the planet should go. That's just how I, I feel like we are not in a safe culture. And so we need to unwork that. Agreed. But Agreed. One way, if you don't want to start digging into your thoughts or they're just not there and it's frustrating to you every time you try, notice where you're feeling it in your body and then just hold that spot period. That'll do it. And if you want to add something to that, you can say, thanks for telling me. Mm, yes. Because our bodies do communicate with us constantly. That's what's happening. Yeah. It's, um, and once you attain that sort of level of awareness of that and you dive deeper and deeper and deeper, you can get more and more information about yourself, but that's a different topic. And then we'll, we'll just keep that over, over there for now. And I would also like to say, because I, I feel like um, in my personal profession, because I do energetic work with people, is that um, I send people to therapists, not 100% of the time, but probably in the 98th percent. You know, if a person comes to me for a single session, obviously that's that. However, I can heal someone over and over and over again with Reiki or light work or whatever. And if the core belief is not addressed, you pull that energy out again and again and again and again, and you're still going to keep filling up that with the same type of energy yeah. that keeps you feeling bad, and you don't let it go fully until you address those core beliefs in therapy. That's why it's so crucial, and I, I really love sharing that with people because as our culture, we're also in the mindset of one thing. One thing is going to cure it all. One thing is going to be that thing, or I only want to deal with one thing. And we are a complicated set of systems. We sure are. Right. That requires so many different things. And so it's, I think really hard for people to kind of wrap the brain around that because with Western medicine, you're a symptom and a medication or a treatment. But we're a whole body. <laughs> totally, Ash. Totally. Oh, so good. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's how the field of energy psychology really came about is because we realized you can't just, mm -hmm. I mean, I kind of want to be like, show of hands, people who are depressed. How many of you, an antidepressant cured everything? I've never heard of that. And that's because it's not just that one thing, right? And so... Thank you for referring people to therapists when they need that deeper work. I, in turn, refer people to Reiki practitioners, massage therapists, other energetic body workers, because I have clients that until they can even get in their body, touch their body, let somebody else help them with their body, we're not going to get any traction, mm -hmm. right? Because the defenses are too high. And energy work is a fantastic way to get embodied. Yes. Beautiful. Yes. Because as you release things, you're allowing things to kind of settle in. And when you get to a certain point in your settling, you start making neural connections in the body that when you are so triggered, um, your energy is just, and you yeah. just seriously can't experience yourself inside in an appreciable way. You know, like if you bang your toe, obviously you're going to feel that. But for a lot of the other stuff, it is truly 
just allowing enough ease. And even when I have worked with people that are in therapy and their therapists have referred them to me and can you help with this? It also helps allow when something's just really stuck, it kind of opens it up and allows it to just kind of out so that the therapy can go deeper and the energy work can go deeper and the massage work can do more and the nutrition is better. Like it's, it's that whole being. So there's so much involved in that. And that's my personal soapbox. <laughs> it's a great soapbox because it absolutely removes those barriers that you're talking about. Right. And if you are not experienced at being in your body and I wasn't with CPTSD. I mean, literally when I walked into my first therapist's office, she's like, oh, you're a floating head. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you're either going to help me or hurt me. I don't know. It was awesome. Right. But she also was the person who introduced me to energy psychology. And I'll tell you what, without that, I don't think that I would have gotten where I'm at as fast or as long lasting. And so Reiki in particular is a beautiful way to get in touch with what energy feels like in your body. Because mm -hmm. if you haven't been here, you don't know. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. It's so <laughs> <Don't not> true. <laughs> and as a person who also had CPTSD, um, it is almost wanting to escape your body. Honestly, you don't you don't even have the urge to really want to be in your body because there is so much pain and just going on all the time because your um, fight or flight freeze response is almost continual with the adrenaline. Um, oh, and can I put a point in? Yeah. I realize I'm interrupting you. I'm so I'm sorry. Okay. All right. What you're saying is beautiful and really important. And you won't know what that feels like in your body unless you are with somebody trustworthy. So even when you're looking for an energy practitioner, even if it's not therapy, you want somebody who's done their own energy work and you should feel absolutely brazen asking that question. What do you do for healing, right? Because unless you're trusting the person you're with, it's gonna put another barrier in there. And more importantly, trusting yourself the reason we dissociate, which is that out of body experience that we're talking about, we do that because it saved us. And I'm not joking about that. It saved you at some point to dissociate. And that's why you keep doing it. So mm -hmm. all we got to do is get in the body, like update the software, <laughs> <laughs> right? And with that software, you're going to get your new app installed. You'll be able to feel your body more. You'll be able to see what's going on. Please be kind to yourself and stop mm -hmm. being angry at your triggers. Like it used to make me mad that I would get triggered. Stop being angry with your triggers or frustrated or sad or giving up whatever your negative experience is or stressful experience. Those triggers are trying to save your life. Yes. They just don't know that you're stronger now. And it takes time and getting in touch with those parts of you to allow yourself to become more aware of your own systems of communication. It's important. And I love when we can bring the whole body experience together for a person. I think that is beautiful beyond belief. Yeah. Well, that whole thing is whole being healing, right? Yes. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. whole being healing, yes. So anything that you can do to help yourself, um, it's important and definitely finding practitioners with whom you resonate. That is crucial because there are so many people that do what I do, but we don't all resonate the same. Sometimes I refer people to someone, another Reiki practitioner, because I'm just not the right connection. Right. And I feel like having a robust network for yourself, you know, mental, um, physical, energetic, nutritional, all of that just makes life flow better for you. You feel better in life. Tabitha, yes. I am so grateful to you for joining me today. I appreciate um, you sharing so much about your expertise in therapy and energy psychology. And I am looking forward to listening to more of your podcast, Ooh. which is the CPTSD podcast and I will put the link for that one in the link as well. 
Thank you. Thank you. So, may I add something real quick, yeah. Ash? Okay. Um, I have a guide on how to find mm. a therapist. And part of that guide is how to know if you have CPTSD, because that's what I do, right? But if you would like to make that guide available to your listeners, let me know, and I will hook you up, <laughs> because exactly. it can be overwhelming finding a therapist. Oh, gosh, right? There are so many, and you don't know. Yeah. Um, really what the fit might be. So having a guide that walks you through that process, huge. Yes. I would be thrilled. And I know the listeners would be very appreciative as well. So thank okay. you for that as well. 